when we think of instinct, a sort of species behavior, patterns of behavior, the best example I can think of is my cats. And then we'll apply that to ourselves uh, in a minute. But it, with my cats, uh, I, I have two cats. We always get two cats because, uh, you know, they need each other. And uh, at the, when you go to the rescue, our particular rescue was able to tell us a story a little bit about our cats. And so when we went in, there was this one cat that they said, this is the smartest cat we've ever had in the rescue. You have to see this cat. Nine months old, his name was Misty. And they had a room where you could take your adoptive pet to see how everybody got along. And sure enough, you know, Misty is the smartest cat in the world. Nine months old, and they explained to us that Misty had been with the cat lady. There were 30 other cats in the house. They said that he, he was well fed, he was not neglected, but that there were a lot of cats and he was on his own without a lot of humans. And then uh, to get the second cat, once we knew we had the smartest cat, we brought in a variety of cats to see who got along well with Misty. And then uh, it turned out this other now five month old cat, Melissa, was the one who got along best with Misty. Her story, they told us, was that she was raised in a cage before she was uh, brought to, to the animal rescue. She was in a cage and she was fed, she was not neglected, but that had been her life previously. So there you go. I can do a case study of the cats in so far as both of my cats have a personal unconscious and they have an instinctual unconscious. We'll get to the instinctual in a minute, but the personal unconscious is that because I know the history, uh, I know how self-sufficient Misty is. He is perfectly fine being on his own. He is king of all that he commands, but he does have these Freudian behaviors, which are what you would call displacements more when he was little than now, but Misty used to make what we called Misty piles. He would gather up all the toys that he liked, take them in his mouth, and hide them under the bed in a big pile, a Misty pile, and then he would sit on the pile. And to this day, if something new comes, a new toy or even new shoes, something like that, Misty will sit on it as a statement of, I own this now. To me, that neurotic behavior, neurotic cat behavior of his personal unconscious comes from the fact that when you grow up with 30 other cats around you who are all bigger than you are, you have to own what you want or someone will take it away from you. That's in his personal unconscious. Melissa is the scared cat. She was raised in a cage. She is very suspicious of all new people, all new things. And where you really see this personal unconscious coming out is in fact happens every day at feeding time because Misty eats very fast. He inhales his food almost without chewing. Because if you're growing up with 30 cats, you better eat fast or there's not going to be any food. Melissa, on the other hand, raised in a cage, eats very slowly. She's kind of picky. And so to feed the two cats together, you have to watch that Misty will finish first and will take whatever food is there. Both of those cats have a personal unconscious from their personal history. But now we come to the instinctual part. 
And we get to, I know for a fact that my cats never observed other cats hunting. I know for a fact that with very few exceptions, and especially when they were young cats, they never saw a mouse. And yet, you can see both cats exhibit, obviously, feline behavior. They have hunting behavior. They have exploring behavior. They are territorial behavior. And, of course, they move and they act like cats. They have a feline instinct. And part of the question is, how does that happen? That a cat acts like a feline, a dog acts like a canine, and humans act like homo sapiens. Freud's second model, now, 20 years later, coming in 1920 in the book Beyond the Pleasure Principle, is called the structural model. And you can see a different arrangement that gives us more complexity because that's the first time where he talks about the famous id, the ego, and the superego. Just historically, it's important to note all of those sort of Latin terms, ego, id, super ego, were added by English translators in German when Freud is writing just for himself. The id is called the it, das es. The ego is called das ish, the I, and the super ego called the uber ish. And then that structural model now gives us something else because he gets a little more into an aspect where it's more difficult to see how much is conscious, how much is not conscious. So the ego, we're going to have to talk about the ego to get that straight, but let's say the ego is what we call executive function, decision-making, the rational part of our personality, sandwiched in between two competing forces. So let's talk about the superego. It's sort of a very basic assumption, and yet I think people have trouble realizing just how dominated they can be by the superego in the sense that the superego is the pressure to conform from society. And you would say that is external. Freud gives us a useful insight in that it is also internal insofar as the child internalizes the views of the father and the mother. So that social pressure, the way the father and the mother have reached an ego compromise with their own parents and society, is internalized in the child as right and wrong what is good to do, what is bad to do, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And in that sense, then, the internal part is, even if a person escapes the outside pressure, the inside pressure to conform to the superego, thou shalt not, that's the superego, plays a large role in determining how we feel, guilt, all of those aspects of the superego. Two competing forces, the id on the one side and the superego on the other side in the sense that the id is now Freud is bringing in sort of instinctual functioning and the id includes sort of the impulses and impulsivity of childhood. Uh, you know, you want to kill your father, you, you hate your newborn sibling, 
all of those powers uh, come in. And then as far as the id goes, we'd have to say it's, I mean, it's worse than that because it includes sort of the social functioning. So let's think about Freud's idea of the id. The classic quote and definition is from a little bit later than ego and the id. It comes in 1933. And this is his way of talking about this nature part of our unconscious, right? It is the dark, inaccessible part of our personality. What little we know of it, we have learned only from our study of the dream work and, of course, the construction of neurotic symptoms, and most of that is of a negative character and can only be described as a contrast to the ego. We approach the id with analogies. We call it chaos, a cauldron full of seething excitations. It is filled with energy, reaching it from the instincts, but it has no organization produces no collective will, but only a striving to bring about the satisfaction of the instinctual needs subject to the observance of the pleasure principle. Where id is, there shall ego be. That's, that's the classic quote. Or a little bit more in 1940, the paper on the outline of psychoanalysis. The id contains everything that is inherited, that is present at birth, is laid down in the constitution, above all, therefore, the instincts, which originate from the somatic organization and which find a first psychical expression here in the id in forms unknown to us. We're forming this idea, Freud is forming this idea of the dark continent of the id. And that's interesting, the dark continent, because it's also a reference to Africa. And there's a way in which we can't approach the id without the fantasy of the famous primal horde. When Freud tried to imagine what people were like without an ego and how they would live, he imagined this situation in prehistory, the dawn of humanity, in which the primal horde controlled everybody's emotions and behavior. So the famous passage in Freud about the primal horde now is in 1913 in Totem and Taboo, and sort of this is the famous piece. You probably heard this before. Freud sets up this idea of the primal horde by imagining a band, a family in prehistoric times ruled by a strong domineering father who, of course, had all of the uh, sexual part, the women uh, under bondage, because that's what a primal horde is, is like, right? The strong man. To quote directly, this is the famous passage in Totem and Taboo from 1913. One day, the brothers who had been driven out came together, killed and devoured their father, and so made an end to the patriarchal horde. Cannibal savages as they were, it goes without saying that they devoured their victim as well as killing him. The totem meal, which is perhaps mankind's earliest festival, would thus be a repetition and a commemoration of this memorable and criminal deed, which was the beginning of so many things, of social organization, of moral restrictions, and of religion. That is Freud's picture of what primordial human beings are like, of what savages are like, and a fantasy about the killing of the primal father as the beginning of morals, social organization, and religion. Now, Freud didn't call this his fantasy of something that might have happened. For him, it was what happened. The 
original sin, the primary guilt of human beings, is from this act that actually happened. And there's obviously a lot that's problematic about his fantasy now being taken literally. And one of the things we have to say, because it comes into everything we want to talk about, about this instinctual unconscious, is that this idea that personal individual experiences can be inherited and passed on to future generations is called Lamarckism. After Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, 1744 to 1829, in which he argues that acquired characteristics within the lifetime of an individual, and his famous example was giraffes. Giraffes have long necks because the mother reaches her neck up to get the leaves, and it stretches the neck, passes to the next generation, and the child lifts his neck up, passes on to the next generation. Those are personally acquired characteristics, and it's called epigenetics, as opposed to Darwin's view of evolution. And so, I mean, I have to say, you do realize that the way we understand evolution now is that evolution proceeds through genetic changes your personal memories or experiences are not passed along to future generations. So to say Lamarckism is to accuse someone of an invalid view of how things are inherited and passed on, and we do have to say that both Freud and Jung have been accused of Lamarckism when they propose things like the primal father, or in Jung's case, the idea of a national unconscious, much less the really terrible idea of a racial unconscious, those would be Lamarckian characteristics that are outside of the Darwinian model. And coming back to Darwin, we have to say this idea of the primal horde originates with Darwin himself. Again, going back to when he's thinking about prehistory and what early human beings were like. So in The Descent of Man, part three, sexual selection in relationship to man, as in humans, From 1871, Darwin speaks of the primal horde. To quote Darwin, Let us suppose the members of a tribe practicing some form of marriage to spread over an unoccupied continent, they would soon split up into distinct hordes, separated from each other by various barriers, and still more effectively by the incessant wars between all barbarous nations. The hordes would thus be exposed to slightly different conditions and habits of life, and sooner or later come to differ in some small degree. Thus, the differences between tribes, at first very slight, would gradually and inevitably become more or less increased. In other words, selection, pressure, making the tribes evolve in a different way. And now we're back to prehistory and the primal horde as a barbarous nation with incessant wars. And we can push that back even farther that we can talk about Thomas Hobbes, famous for his description of what's called, uh, you know, Hobbesian man, which is essentially uncivilized human beings. And again, this is the famous quote from his book, Leviathan, in in 1651. And which is worst of all, continual fear and the danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That is Hobbes' fantasy of primordial man. So, you could say we 
come across this fantasy of what life was like before civilization, the life of the instinctual human. And, of course, what we're getting is what I, back in my old career, we would call that a negative anthropology, right? Is that it's savage, dark, the pleasure principle, and human beings without impulse control. That is the negative anthropology, the, the dark side. But you could also say, just while we're at it, you know, the other side would be a positive anthropology. And we also get this idea of the noble savage. Back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the idea of natural man in his natural state. And you find that in Jung, for instance, back, back to his trip in 1925 to uh, Africa. Jung describes this experience that he has looking out over the plains of the Serengeti to set it up. A quote here that he is on the train. And he looks up and on the top of the hill, he sees a lone figure uh, with a spear, kind of uh, a Maasai warrior. And then he offers this reflection. I had the feeling that I had already experienced this moment and had always known this world, which was separated from me only by distance in time. It was as if... I were in this moment returning to my youth, as if I knew that dark-skinned man who had been waiting for me for 5,000 years. Now, in dealing with Freud's structural model of an id, superego, and ego, I have to say perhaps that for some people this is really very simple and that you know sort of what is coming later, which is that Jung develops a much more robust picture of the structure of the unconscious. But I just ask you to be patient because we have to have the background before we get to something more complicated and descriptive. But it does put us at the point now of being able to really think about the fantasy of the primal horde, which is the id. And this fantasy of Freud, of Darwin, of the negative anthropology, we have to ask, was it really that way? Is that what the childhood of humanity looks like? Was it really, you know, as Hobbes said, nasty, brutish, and short? Because we actually know a thing or two about living in a hunter-gatherer society. And the picture that we get there is a very different picture than this, shall we say, projection of Freud, onto the childhood of humanity, and in fact, the entire enterprise of trying to combine the instinctual urges of children with early humans, one would have to say is essentially racist and colonialist that it is a projection of Freud's imagination of what life outside of an industrialized society would be like. When, in fact, that we know from hunter-gatherer societies, it's not like the fantasy at all. (music) 